I want to ask you to create a mental, an image in your mind's eye of two twin adversaries. Does anybody here ever wrestle uh, folk style or folk style or Greco-Roman? No wrestlers. I was a big fan in, in college and watched many of these, these contests. Um, so imagine these twin wrestlers, not WWF, that's why I make that clarification, um, of equal stature, equal reach, same training, same coaching, same level of skill. I ask you, which one of those is going to win the match? Well, I say the smarter one. Because the smarter adversary is going to make better sense of the situation and either move more quickly using that information or simply make a better decision and act better. And so we can be done here in actually a minute because my point here is the adversary and the, the fighter who understands that the key weapon of the future is the mind will be the victor. So again, thank you, Lee. Thank you, Allison. Lieutenant General is gone, but Dr. Cross, thank you for having me here today. I have to add a quick disclaimer to say uh, I'm not here to talk about a product strategy. And in fact, in a, in a way, this doesn't even represent IBM's particular position. This is my own particular point of view as an industry expert to share with you how I think the future will look and what we can do to catapult ourselves to a different way of using cognitive computing systems. So um, Lee, you're also kind of mean because you, you forwarded my TED Talk uh, link in advance, which actually forced me to do a lot uh, of new material. I wasn't necessarily planning to do that, but th thank you. But if you've seen the TED Talk already, um, that's good because I'm going to build on that concept. And if you haven't, that's cool too because we're going to do a quick cliff notes um, and move on from there. So the point of the talk was that I, that I argue uh, we should be building libraries of mental models, essentially. And that this is really critical for us, uh, really, as a society and a culture to advance the state of cognitive computing. And I think, and I argue in the TED Talks, it's really for the good of humanity. And there are good national security reasons why we here in this room might want to think about doing something similar for the US Defense Department, maybe our allies as well. And really, the whole idea is that I argue, and I still I really do believe this, that we can capture and record, curate, archive, and reuse critical thinking strategies of experts in industries. And this could be really handy because in the event of some kind of catastrophic loss, or if you wanted to scale or surge expertise for an industry very quickly, you might want to be thinking and planning about how does industry expertise behave and perform, and how can you scale it out now? And I think this is an appropriate place to do it when we think about scaling expertise by TRADOC, that's what you do. And there's a problem with human expertise in that it really doesn't scale well. In fact, I would challenge you to condense everything you've learned today to take it back to your command or your unit, your organization, and take all of that information and transfer it effectively to your colleagues. It's virtually impossible today. Well, let's talk about industry expertise. Some, why do I think that this can be done? Why do I think that we can capture expertise and scale it and then use artificial intelligence to transfer it to others? or work in concert with people? I think so because I see that other industries adjacent to my own, I happen to be working in a company that has a nice global reach and many different industries that it touches, can see it in healthcare and in medicine, where cognitive computing is really working with medical professionals to learn the process of diagnosis. And this is working because diagnosis itself is a mental model or a thinking strategy that experts use. And in the medical community, they figured out how to transfer that critical thinking strategy to young students so they can employ it in the field later. 
And I can give you another example from a financial services sector. Think about loan applicants um, or, or the officers who decide on loans. We know that in industry, the financial service sector, there are some general approaches, some general ways to think about the risk associated with a loan applicant. These are general heuristics and general rules of thumb. There might even be algorithms that distill that kind of industry approach. But one bank might differ from another because they're going to apply their own perspective on risk. I saw a really interesting film recently um, about um, Bank of America starting and how it was started. It was originally, believe it or not, the, the, the first bank of Italy in San Francisco. And that was surprising to me, but it, it was really cool because after uh, the great earthquake of San Francisco, uh, this one man, a businessman, decided that in order to get his Italian-American community back on its feet, he was going to give money away because he knew they were a good bet, even though these people had no homes, no jobs, no industry. He trusted his risk calculus was very different based on his own personal experience, informed by his culture, and informed by his personal risk tolerance. So when I think about capturing industry expertise, I think about this in stages that we might lean into it a bit, attempt to really capture expert thinking strategies in specific defense domains, whether it's intelligence, or operations, human capital management, logistics and supply chain. Doesn't really, we could just pick one to start and try to capture it for uh, the industry and then begin to think about different applications for different, perhaps, contexts or situations. And ultimately, our goal would be to capture expert thinking strategies by individual. And I'm betting in the come here that neuroscience is going to help us along that we're going to have more holistic ways. I'm not the expert here, but I'm anticipating that we will have more holistic ways to capture thinking strategies. Not actual thoughts, that's creepy, uh, but really how people think about solving problems, really a mental process flow. So the premise here is, for national security, it, it's really important. We think about um, Secretary, Undersecretary Bob Work saying uh, we need a third offset because we've never been able, we never want to be in a contest where you have to go up against an adversary tank for tank, ship for ship, bomb for bomb. We need something else. And so what is that something else? Again, back to those two wrestlers, I really think we need to be the smarter adversary. And in order to do that, I think we need to tip the balance in the investment we've been making in the OODA loop. So Colonel John Boyd, uh, really an amazing strategist, he was an Air Force colonel, but I think notable here at TRADOC to mention that he enlisted in the Army first. Um, he's a familiar name to us now because he uh, invented what we call the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. And his thesis was, if you can disrupt your adversary's OODA loop or accelerate your own, you can have a strategic advantage. Well, that's, we take it for granted that that's truth. But if you think about our investments in the OODA loop over the past 60 years, it's really been tremendous investment in sensor technology and the perception, the observe portion of the OODA loop. And I could spend hours talking, and I won't this afternoon, but spend hours talking about how that's driven significant investment in sensor systems, remote sensing, that drove more investment in communications and networking, and, and now we have a big data problem. It's a good problem to have. But it's a big O, little o, D, A today. Because we haven't spent as much or exerted as much effort in the orientation and decide portions of the OODA loop. So I think it's absolutely imperative that we begin to think about it because the time is appropriate. As we've seen today with some of the distinguished speakers talking about the research areas coming from academia and other research institutions, we're at a tipping point with cognitive computing. So 
one of the things, I'm going to retell one anecdote from, from the um, TED Talk, and, and that is because I really find this particular example really compelling for me personally. Last fall, former President Obama was talking with his presidential historian, Doris Kearns Goodwin. And in the interview, he confided to her, I thought this was just an amazing personal admission. He said, the situation in Syria haunts me constantly. I think, was there something that wasn't being presented to me? Was there some move that we hadn't seen that maybe a Churchill could have thought of or an Eisenhower might have seen? I just wish I, I could have had a different level of insight. I find that chilling because this is the leader of the free world with the very best advice a human could possibly have in today's day and age. And yet even he was confounded by this concern about course of action advice. Now he wasn't talking about actually recapturing Churchill's specific plan to address the problems in Europe. He really wants to tap the thinking strategy of an expert like Churchill, who can unravel a complex global security problem that was fraught with violence, multiple stakeholders, international ones at that, and the, the problem of a humanitarian crisis on top of it. So that's a terrible conundrum for us, the conundrum of expertise, is that it's perishable and it doesn't scale. But what if, what if it could be different? And we've all felt this loss ourselves. When you think about anyone who's worn a uniform knows what it feels like when a highly valued NCO leaves the unit, whether on a routine reassignment or through some, something worse, some unexpected loss. So what if we could have something different? What if the platoon commander headed to Mosul actually had the advantage of knowing all the lessons learned from every platoon commander who had ever been in Mosul or Fallujah or any urban conflict, as well as the advice that comes from really deeply understanding our rules of engagement and the cultural influences that he or she's going to run into in that city. What if we could build that and literally embed it in the uniform? It would mean that that platoon commander doesn't have to go check some database of lessons learned six weeks in advance of deployment when he or she's really trying to get people ready. I really think we could also envision that that course of action advisor would be dynamic and not rules-based, because we're not trying to just recapture specific actions that previous commanders had taken. We're talking about advice and counsel, and something that's much more dynamic, because you want to be able to understand, really deeply understand the situation, not just have situational awareness or dots on maps that are moving, but really understand intent. So have this course of action advisor embedded perhaps in the uniform that you're going to make. Have that course of action advisor also instrumented to understand the complex and dynamic uh, AOR by linking it to the sensors and systems. So to start our journey to this battlefield of the future, I really want to just, again, make a couple more um, disclaimers, but consider where we are right now before we embark on that uh, science fiction vision. And you have to accept with a, with a few apologies, I'm not an academic. I don't have a PhD. My perspective is one from a, what I'll call it the trenches of trying to wrestle with this technology to make it really work to solve problems today. And so understanding where we are with artificial intelligence today, or what I call cognitive computing, I think is important. But I think it's important because I believe we can do it. So number one, lessons learned. 
I've noticed a pattern with all of our cognitive computing projects. I can I could tell you right now which ones are going to fail. And I can tell you which ones fail because they're the ones where people don't know themselves. They don't understand how they think or their teams think or how their organization should think about a problem. I'll give you a, a, an example. It's actually kind of a sad um, example about uh, veteran suicide and questions I've had about whether or not cognitive computing can help with that problem. And, and since these early conversations, I think we're beginning to unpack how we might be able to inject cognitive computing into behavioral analytics to help the defense forces um, solve or begin to unravel or assist with that problem, not solve it. Um, but really, people in the beginning would say, well, why can't you point your systems at veterans to help predict and prevent veteran suicide? And my first question to them is, how do you, as a leader, or how do you, as a medical professional, understand, predict, and prevent veteran suicide today? And then it's silence. Right? This is a very hard problem, and it's unsolved. And so my point is, you can't just point cognitive computing at problems and expect them to be solved. So I've had recently great pleasure of working with um, a client uh, this past fall who did a, a quick pilot project. And it was fabulous because in that particular project, I knew it was going to go well because the homework had been done to really understand how analysts in their organization can unpack a problem time slow, meaning just the manual process that a human takes. They really thought about it in their mission, and they really were masters of their tradecraft. And that's why that project went well. Because then you could really be deliberate in how you applied the technology. It wasn't that they needed PhDs in artificial intelligence. They just needed to really understand how they think. It made all the difference in the world. So let's talk about terms. I use the term cognitive computing interchangeably with artificial intelligence. That kind of goes back to IBM lawyers in the early days after the Jeopardy competition telling us that artificial intelligence was too scary. But what I mean by that are systems that reason, learn, and understand. So again, I'm not an academic. I'm doing this just to clarify what I mean. Um, when we say reason, learn, and understand, what we mean is they learn because they're using technologies like machine learning to continuously learn. And they do require training, either supervised machine learning approaches or unsupervised machine learning approaches. We use both. When we say that they understand, we mean that these cognitive computing systems have been built to understand the same kind of input that a human might, so that they can ultimately break down that barrier between humans and machines. So things like natural language text, speech or audio in general, uh, visual input. So that's what we mean by understand. And by reason, we mean that we're using combinations of technologies, again, typically machine learning or natural language processing or other things, to make sure that these systems can reason over that unstructured content in a way that would make sense to a person as well. So that, that's just uh, simple terms. Now today, I think it's really important we also talk about something, and I'm surprised hasn't come up yet today, um, but in, in, uh, there's a lot of discussion about narrow artificial intelligence versus artificial general intelligence. So there's a lot of artificial narrow intelligence, and this means Artificial intelligence that's been designed to really mimic or emulate a human cognitive function uh, that's very narrow and it's within a domain, it's for a specific task. And this is everywhere. So for example, Siri, I would assert, is a narrow artificial intelligence application where you can ask Siri very effectively, brilliantly. Millions of people are doing this right now as we speak. Siri, what's my next appointment? Siri, call my mother. But if you turn to Siri and you say, you ask her a question that any one of you I could ask, and any but my, I could ask a second grader, um, how do I tie my shoes? And Siri will say, interesting question, because she's defaulted to a script, because that didn't fit her, what she'd been trained to do for a very discreet task, essentially frequently asked questions, and to have a, a bit of a conversational dialogue. 
It's not to undermine its brilliant capability. It's amazing. Nest thermostats, another really good example. It's a very, very narrow intelligence because it's using machine learning to, to learn the pattern in your home and then optimize your thermostat for your house. But if I go up to my Nest thermostat and I say, how do I tie my shoes? It won't even answer interesting question because it hasn't been designed even for that specific narrow function of dialogue. But all of this artificial intelligence is around you already. It's ubiquitous. It's, it's going to be as common as the plugs in the walls with electricity running through it. It's going to be everywhere. Now, artificial general intelligence is this idea that ultimately artificial intelligence can perform with a similar level of competence that humans do with all cognitive tasks. And co artificial general intelligence does not exist today. Experts debate on when it's going to happen and on its current course and speed, I could certainly not predict. And so I'm offering this because I want to tell you I'm grounded in the reality that as a practitioner, in order to get to that future battlefield, my team and I, we have to use what we have now, which is artificial narrow intelligence. So how do you actually get there? I'm offering an evolutionary, maybe a plotting approach that might not even <laughs> sound futuristic, but I really believe it can be done. I also have to tell you, I, I feel like even if we had um, artificial general intelligence today, working with federal government acquisition processes, it would take us another 10 to 20 years to acquire it, and then it would, we'd have to actually figure out how to clear it in a clearance process, and that would probably take another five to 10 years, so I'll be dead by then, I'm not gonna worry about it. Um, the reality is, we have narrow artificial intelligence. So I recently read a blog by a guy named Tim Urban, not, neither a neuroscientist nor an artificial intelligence practitioner, but he's hilarious, and I wanted to share this quote with you, um, so I'm, I'm gonna read it, apologies. He writes, um, he was trying to describe how we might get to uh, artificial general intelligence one day or how to get these superior AI systems. And he suggested this term called brain plagiarism. And I love this. He says, this is like scientists toiling over that kid who sits next to them in class, who's so smart, keeps doing so well on the test, and even though that they keep studying diligently, they can't do nearly as well as that kid. And then they finally describe, screw it. I'm just gonna copy that kid's answers. It makes sense, we're stumped trying to build a super complex computer, and there happens to be a perfect prototype in each one of our heads. Well, he goes on to talk about um, this school of thought in artificial intelligence that one might actually attempt to emulate the physiology of the brain and really try to rebuild circuitry that looks like that. Not in that camp at all, quite the opposite. I don't think we need to recreate the same circuitry of the brain. This is a bit of a cheat. I think we just need to emulate some brain functions, get the same answers as a smart kid, and then use these tools on hand, these artificial narrow intelligence tools in a, in a systems engineering way to concatenate them and make them into more complex reasoning functions. So this is exactly how we're doing things today. We're, we're not reworking inner brains. We're not re-engineering those. So let's talk about an example. Okay, the example that I wanted to discuss was speech to text. So I think, Professor, you talked about this earlier and you showed the, the much uh, more deeply technical view of a speech to text application. But I think of this as a perfect example of a building block cognitive function that can be used in myriad different ways in many, many different apps and could be integrated into different systems later on. So think about this. Um, a speech-to-text cognitive tool accepts audio input, translates it to written text. That could then be integrated into a tool like a Siri for um, casual help buying movie tickets, figuring out your next appointment. That's great. It could also be used to help people with disabilities who might not be able to type or text. That's great. 
We might use it in law enforcement or national security purposes in an intercept, uh, like a voice intercept uh, triage tool to understand what's going on. Or we might then turn to that question of veteran suicide prevention or even active duty suicide prevention to think, okay, what if you could concatenate a speech to text cognitive function with one that's applying psycholinguistics, and this exists today in our in cognitive computing applications, one that would interpret basically what your words mean, how they reflect your personality. We could baseline a personality by just listening to our service members. Perhaps we could use that to baseline what normal looks like for that individual so that we can later understand and anticipate when they're becoming stressed or if they've survived an extremely stressful or traumatic event, which apparently is a correlation with veteran suicide. Maybe tone analysis could also be layered on top of that. But my point here is, if you really think about breaking these up into discrete functions and using them like building blocks, I love the stack that the professor showed earlier with the infrastructure and then the layer for analytics and what I would call COGS, the AI functions. And I would add maybe another nuance on top of it, which is this library of mental models. Because if we can understand our industries well enough, then we would be able to understand in the mental models there are discrete cognitive functions that can be married up with these cognitive computing functions, um, these AI COGS, and then we can mix and match applications really quickly. So I want to say one, one last thing that I've noticed as a trend in industry, and that is when we speak with IT professionals, we, we have a lot of conversations with them about data. It seems like all of a sudden the epiphany has happened where people realize how important data is. And I've been counseled a few times that, Julianne, it's all about the data. And I just want to mention, I get that it's about the data, but if you focus too much on the data, you forget that data is dead without adding the method of thinking about the data. Data can do nothing for you unless you're really employing some cognitive function to make sense of it. So again, in this big data environment, the only way out is to lean into the orientation part of the OODA loop and the decide part of the OODA loop by employing and scaling out cognitive computing functions. So just to wrap, my solution is libraries of cognitive models, modular approaches to inject the cognitive computing capabilities into virtually everything. I think we need to do it in a systematic way. I'd like to see investment in the technologies to capture those mental models as well in neuroscience. I think we need to think about cartridge-like applications for content as well as these cognitive functions so that we can mix and match the content and the data even more, more quickly. So basically, a system engineering approach to decompose our problem to get to that future battlefield. So now I've talked for probably 20, 25 minutes about these crazy ideas of how we get there. And I'll tell you, none of our systems can touch um, even a 14-year-old's aptitude for synthesizing information, making inferences, and coming to conclusions. I told my, my son, who's not a genius, he's a reasonably intelligent kid, I, I did a dry run with him on this uh, discussion. He said, okay, so um, you want to use AI to put a patent, general patent, in every soldier's pocket. I said, yeah, patent in a pocket. That's exactly what I would want to build. So thank you for listening, and I'll take questions. Uh, Ma'am, you mentioned uh, the Boyd Zero Loop and that we got the observation very well, having challenges with the, the D slash decide. 
Do you think in today's environment, the commanders know that the, there is so much information out there that they are waiting for perfect information before they act? Do you think that's contributing to it? Yeah, so I, I don't know the answer to that question because I'm not spending as much time with um, commanders talking about the, their decision-making process. Definitely know that we're, at a, we're beyond a tipping point with an inability to make sense of the data that they do have. That is the most common refrain. People will say, we, we don't know how to deal with all of this. And that actually has led to the most significant investments in our cognitive computing technologies to date because people are tr looking for ways to um, work themselves out of this conundrum they've gotten into with too much data. <coughs> Sir. I don't know which the setting is on, right? Um, I like your, you know, your distinction about narrow and, and uh, broad or, or wide or whatever, general intelligence, artificial intelligence. Uh, all the, uh, the artificial intelligence we have is narrow to some degree or another. Or, um, and I think that the right evolutionary path um, is to not try to take a, a flying leap into the ultimate general intelligence. Uh, but to go step by step. So one example of that uh, is the transfer learning that I mentioned in my talk. Um, another example of that is what Watson does in trying to gather in one place uh, all of the knowledge relevant to a particular uh, domain, whether it be cancer treatment and so forth. So um, it's not general in terms of all disciplines or all procedures, but it is general beyond a particular narrow specialty to the, all the adjacent specialties as well. Yep. Uh, so you can still build consistent models. Um, so that was sort of my my comment. Um, I do have a. a I'm so relieved, actually. I felt very <laughs> insecure about you know speaking to professors about artificial yeah. narrow intelligence. So thank you. Uh, but by the way, I concede the uh, arm wrestle, so you win. <laughs> 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 um, I, I I I do have um, one one question. Uh, um, viewed not so much from the trenches developing uh, Watson, but from the trenches sort of using uh, or extending or applying the, the, the Watson technology. Um, what would you think would be one or two of the next um, major challenges that are doable from where we stand today as opposed to um, somewhere on the path between here and 2030? Right, okay. So um, I wanna respond to your comment first because um, I, I think it's, it's sometimes um, missed that the, the Jeopardy game playing system had a number of accomplishments. One of them, from a research perspective, was to advance the state of um, broad domain question and answering. And so, Professor, you pointed out earlier today, rightfully, that there is an open field, open research question still, there's still more progress to be made in Q&A. Um, the, the really, one of the really neat things about that Jeopardy game playing system that most people don't realize is that there was a real integration challenge there as well. So the Jeopardy game wasn't just um, reading the question, reasoning over the question, finding the right content and bringing it back. There's also a significant game playing strategy piece. And so this, this is kind of interesting and thematic here when we talk about the OODA loop because it turned out that that was probably even maybe just as important as being able to find the relevant text for an answer. Being able to bet the right amount of money and decide when to ring in based on a, a very specific um, confidence criteria that was very dynamic given the state of play in the game, that, that's what blew, I mean that made the game easy for Watson. And so a lot of people don't realize that. I mean, there's a lot of information about that on YouTube if you're interested in it. But it's really one of the things that inspires me to think about how we really need to take a modular approach. Because in order to get to move away from something that is really purely a narrow intelligence system and emulates general intelligence, I think that was the feat for Watson. It kind of persuaded the general public, gosh, you really can have these cognitive computing systems that feel like um, they they're really have human-like intelligence, although that wasn't true at all. Um, okay, so your, your question for me was, 
what, what do I see from my perspective in um, applying this technology and adapting it for real use in the field? What do I think are the next leaps? Do I have that right, that question? So, um, oh gosh, there's a, there are a lot of uh, ways to go with that question. So I, I can talk about adjacency in a couple different areas. So originally, because Watson uh, game playing system was primarily around unstructured text, I would say uh, that's one really important input for uh, a cognitive computing system, right? Like natural language text, super important. But as I said earlier, in order to have persuasive um, cognitive computing systems, you really need to have them understanding input the way other people would have input. And we as humans, we take input in audio and visual. We really need to continue to progress in the visual recognition and in audio and then see how we can combine these things. I also think that there's other sensory modes that we're really not leaning into yet, but that are doable probably to have a system smell or taste um, or touch even, um, which could be very handy for applications, let's say in the commercial world, where um, a shopper might be able to use a cognitive computing system to feel the fabric of something uh, over the internet. Uh, th these are the kind of compelling ideas where IBM Research is investing and it predicts within 20 years they'll be, be able to roll those kinds of things out. Now for national security, I would say um, there, I, I've been thinking about this uh, really more, not, my, not just me, my, myself and my team, uh, we think about this in ter for defense in terms of investments along functional categories. So mission areas. Uh, think the, the J1, the J2, the J3, the J4. So I kind of have an answer for you. We don't, probably don't have enough time for me to talk about how we would invest to um, transform intelligence capabilities, bringing in all these other modalities, integrating uh, systems, especially in um, cognitive computing systems on like mobile devices or in bandwidth limited environments or environments that uh, would require systems to um, operate with other cognitive computing systems in a machine to machine context, decision making thresholds, how we would do this ethically um, and maintaining privacy. There's a lot there um, in the, the intel and operations category. We have a series of investments um, primarily around Internet of Things um, and how to exploit that information and, co and combine that with cognitive computing for uh, logistics and supply chain. Um, and, and I could go on, but we, we uh, think in a very organized and deliberate way about our investments um, to pursue and build applications ultimately uh, along those mission categories. And, I, and then we do that because ultimately it, uh, we kind of like uh, the, I think the um, Dr. Cross said this morning, uh, George Tech, or, or maybe it was you, you said at Carnegie Mellon, you, if, it, if you can't actually make it work, doesn't matter. Um, we have to make it work for our clients, and, the, and our clients have problem sets that are along these mission areas, and so that's guiding our, our thinking and investment strategy. So I understand the concept that you're talking about with this patent in a pocket, and, and I like all the things that you're saying as far as capturing uh, mindsets and capturing thinking strategies and preserving those to, to help future or current uh, commanders and decision makers uh, do a better job in the process. Uh, what I'm curious as to uh, in this world of big data and growing data and uh, and large amounts of inputs, because I, I see commanders all the time and decision makers all the time. And in their decision making process, uh, they, they take a lot of input you know, before they make their decision. I'm, I'm wondering what you imagine the, in, the output of, of your patent in a pocket would, would be like. So yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so again, back to a, an evolutionary approach I think about prototyping something first, I'd want to pick a very controlled situation where I could prove this technology um, and, and that it could actually work to support, let's say, collaborative decision making for a commander. So I would probably want to pick something um, where we could work this out time slow in a lab first to explore what are those boundaries. When, do, when does it become untenable for a human to work with it within timing constraints? 
and then, and then pick even harder challenges. Certainly would not assert that we could even begin to think about just you know, coming up with some kind of prototype for a, a quote unquote patent in a pocket and put it out in the field in a, in a very time sensitive, life threatening situation. Um, but there are probably other th things that we do um, in preparation for deployment uh, where we could probably have maybe a little more time, uh, where there's repeatable processes in the military. Um, another example might be, and I'm picking this out at random now. Um, when we do um, assessment of uh, the future operating environment and we're trying to synthesize information about where the unit is going to go and how they're going to interact with, with people. So um, let me give you an example. Uh, two, there are two and they're related. So I, had a, a, I have a colleague, Mairead McKendry, former FBI officer. When she came to IBM, her first assignment was to go to, um, uh, go to Afghanistan, believe it or not, and assess um, using quantitative analytics how to improve the performance of provincial reconstruction teams. And she came back and she said, Julianne, you'll never believe this. Um, they're using maps that the British created in the 1880s or some year. I, I see a nod in the back, so I'm not making this up. Um, now, why were they using these maps? Well, because the British had done a really fabulous job of understanding the, the tribal um, laydown, you know, in the geospatial context, of where all these different groups were and, um, and had it referenced. And no one had done it since that time. Another colleague of mine who's here in the audience, Brady Moore, came, was telling me about, um, and I'm going to get these details wrong, if so I'll buy you a drink later, but he, and you can tell the real story, um, but he told me about how he was in Afghanistan and uh, somehow, uh, you know, okay, so former Green Beret had a, had a job to do, and somebody said, yeah, we're, we're going to go do something over on Russian Hill. Huh, why is it called Russian Hill? Why was it called Russian Hill, Brady? Right. So the Russians had been there exactly in that, in that spot, and so the hill got that name. So what's my point? My point is, Brady had to make that connection because he noticed something. My friend Mairead, my friend and colleague Mairead, um, observed this dated information. But using technology today, I think that combined learning is available for us and could be teed up. Now, you have a really good point. How, how do you do that in a time-sensitive environment? How do you know what to put in? Maybe a commander in the field doesn't want something squawking in their ear. You could have a patent in the pocket. And I was thinking for my kid to go off to college, I could put like a mom in the pocket. That'd be even better application. So there's definitely things here you don't necessarily want to disrupt people in the field, right? So you have to think about this. Open research question. I want to tackle it, though. Ma'am, we've, we've got... Um... Um, uh, a couple of pretty good questions from the from the chat. I want to highlight kind of one of them about Boyd's OODA loop. Um, you talked about the the emphasis being primarily on the observe phase, and if you shift your emphasis toward kind of speeding things up and and creating efficiencies in the orient and decide phases, um, the question here is: uh, is is it more about uh, structuring the data to help a human make a quicker have a quicker orientation? process, or is it for a machine to uh, go through this orient process faster and suggest a decision or an action? So okay, that's a great question, and I hadn't been thinking of it that way. I, I was thinking really, so this gets to my fascination with the mental models for experts in industry. Um, in order for us to get to a point where we can really help with decision making, we really need to understand how, how does a commander in the field make a decision? Um, what is the mental calculus? And this sort of relates to your question, too. So let's say um, it's, a, it's a challenge or a problem that involves deploying resources or material resources. Um, how much of a quantity of something are going to move from one place to another? So I would say before we tackle that problem of adapting cognitive computing for it, I'd want to know what are the factors that go into play with that decision right now? What data do you use today? What data would you like to use but you can't because it's impenetrable because you either have too much of it or you don't understand it or it's in the wrong structure? Can you, can you design something that can understand it for you? It, can you design something that can understand it more deeply? Go back 100 years to the 1880s and the British maps. You, so 
that's the uptake I would want to do in the beginning. And my point about indexing uh, mental models for in industries, or specifically in defense right now, is that my observation is some of these problems have similarities. Some of these cognitive workflows have enough similarity that a resource problem for um, a tactical commander might also resemble um, a resource challenge, a resource deployment challenge for a logistics officer who might not be forward. So if we can figure out how to um, uh, record these thinking strategies and then uh, maybe, I say digitize them, but what I mean by that is to make them more discrete functions, um, and we have ways of talking about them and putting them together, then I think we're going to see that we can uh, advance the state of the technology. Sorry, I'm getting long-winded on that, on that point. Um, so as far as the decision-making process, I really don't know until you have that conversation with people who are in that industry who really understand how to make those decisions today. I think that's going to be it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.